All right, so before I tell you a little bit about myself, we're going to talk about a little story. So back in the summer of 1943, World War II was going on, and the U.S. Army Air Corps had just gotten a significant amount of assets into Britain with the intent of attacking Germany. So their first large operation they were going to conduct was Operation Gomorrah, where they were going to launch 300 aircraft to attack Hamburg, Germany, with the purpose of kind of destroying a lot of their industrial complex. So in July of 1943, they lost their first operation. 300 aircraft launched, and only 80 of them actually made it to the target. And the reason wasn't enemy fire or anything like that. It actually went back to a training issue where they couldn't get all the aircraft launched and together to actually go do what they were going to do. So the training issue really defined the first part of the failure of this mission, where two-thirds of the package never even got to where they were supposed to be going. And their uh, objective for this mission was the Blom and Voss shipyard in Hamburg, Germany. This is where they had manufactured and repaired U-boats, which are submarines that were attacking the shipping coming from the United States out to England. And the desire was to kind of knock out their long-term repair facilities for the U-boats. So on this mission, 80 aircraft kind of had what you may consider a marginal effect. Uh, they got there, they dropped some of their weapons, but really the shipyard was up and running again a week later and really didn't accomplish what they wanted to. In the process of those 80 aircraft that went out there, 76 came back with some type of damage from their enemy defense that happened. So as we're looking at this, you want to ask, well, what's this have to do with marketing? And the answer is absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> but let's take a look at the context of this a little bit more. So in 1943, these operations were kind of the carpet bombing raids, right? We are going to put as much out there as we possibly can and hope we get what we want. Kind of maybe a saturation method of marketing. So in 1943, this cost of 300 aircraft cost about a quarter million dollars a piece. Take that to today's terms, that's a little over $3 million per each aircraft. Well, if you look at that over the entire rate of just the aircraft, we're not looking at the crews or the training or anything else, that was a quarter of a billion dollars for the 80 aircraft that got there. And if all of them had launched, that would have been a billion dollar raid that was a marginal uh, success at the best. So let's take that context of kind of carpet bombing saturation and compared to how we operate today. If we were to do this strike today, it would only take four aircraft. Those four aircraft would be much more successful. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. They cost about $60 million a piece. So those four aircraft are going to have a greater success with much less assets in place than the blanket style of going out there and dropping ordnance everywhere. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit about how we took over the last 70 years to change that from a very uh, dumb idea of ordnance dropping to a very precise way of doing things where we can be more effective while using less assets at the same time. Uh, and so uh, in the next few minutes, I'll talk about the three kind of efficiencies we got, which are first technology. The second one we used was information distribution. And the last one was how we start our training and standardization process to make sure everyone was on the same page when we were actually going to do these and they had the proper training to actually go and do the mission. So uh, my marketing background is going to be a little bit minimal compared to all yours. Uh, I took a marketing class for my MBA. And uh, Rex passed that in the first 30 seconds of his talk today. So as I, uh, as I make trying to make marketing or communication kind of corollaries, please be kind to me. Uh, it would be much like you making an aviation corollary, probably. Um, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I do and where I've been. So uh, this is what I do. I have been flying fixed-wing fighter aircraft for 15 years. Started a long time ago, did a number of deployments overseas. I spent a lot of time on ships at sea, which is why no matter how much my wife asks me, I will never pay money to go on a cruise ship to go back <laughs> out to sea. Uh, and then graduated Top Gun a long time ago. So first, to put those myths to rest. Uh, it is not like the movie. I have never played beach volleyball with my dog tags on or anything like that. So, so please don't ask. Uh, sorry. Um, however, what uh, Hollywood, Hollywood portrays with Top Gun is pretty much the exact opposite of how it is. It is actually a very analytical, very uh, data-driven decision based on how we learn and how we teach and how we kind of come up with our future tactics. Um, and so that's kind of what I'd like to bring in here is how the Navy goes about doing this. Uh, so although I am in the Navy, uh, please don't confuse me with being an official Navy representative today. I'm doing this of my own volition, so don't blame them for anything I say. My legal team will be very happy that way. Going from that background on how we use data, we're first going to start with technology. So a little bit of a secret. I actually don't fly the airplane. 
I'm a minority shareholder in how the plane is flown. So I have a 59% vote in where the aircraft goes, and computers do the other 51%. So if I say I want to go left, the computer is going to look at it and say, well, based on everything I see, I'm not going to let you do that, just how it is. Uh, it's kind of like the new cars that come out today, where the automatic braking and the lane control and everything else is the computers are going to override you if it sees something it doesn't like. And it's the same for us, uh, except uh, a little bit more uh, technology complicated in how it operates. But what it does is it takes all these inputs, all these sensors, and kind of decides, well, based on what you're telling me to do, I'm actually going to do this. You're just telling me where to go. I'm going to make all the micro adjustments in the aircraft on how we're actually going to do that. And if those micro adjustments are going to do something that's going to depart the aircraft from flight or something other than that, I'm not going to let you do it. The reason they kind of went through all of this was it makes the aircraft very, very easy to fly. Uh, we could probably throw you in a simulator and after a couple hours you could land the aircraft. It's really that easy sometimes. Um, it's still hard to do well, but it is easy in the basic sense. Uh, and the reason they try to make it so easy is because flying an airplane really isn't my job. The aircraft is just a tool to do something else. The aircraft is my tool to go on a mission to do something. And so the easier we can make my operation of flying the aircraft to do the tool, the more I can concentrate my brain power and what I need to do on actually accomplishing the mission and using the aircraft just as another asset available to me to go ahead and accomplish that. So it's getting rid of what gets in the way of what you're doing and trying to get that automated so you can concentrate more on what you're actually trying to accomplish, uh, which is kind of a big leap in some respects of we like doing the little stuff. I like having actual control of a plane. However, as much fun as it is, it's really not what I'm trained and what my job is to do. So the second part of technology outside of controlling the aircraft is the precision now with which we can apply stuff. So we're going to go back to 1943 for a second. And this is the actual building we're in right now. And after this first raid in 1943, the Army Air Corps did a study and said, well, what do I actually need to hit that building out there. And what they found was to put two bombs within a 300 to 400 foot box, they needed over a thousand air, or over a hundred airplanes with over a thousand air crew with over 600 bombs just for two of those bombs to hit what they wanted to. Uh, pretty startling, right? Um, not precise at all, but if you think about how we do a lot of things, we just kind of scatter like a shotgun approach out there hoping something hits what we're trying to accomplish. So what we've done with the technology is we've gone away from that approach and we've gone to a precision approach. So now for that same kind of uh, effects, I can have one aircraft with one pilot with two weapons and I can aim those weapons within 20 feet anywhere on that building I want to based on what I want to hit. And it's not because of me being in the loop that's doing that, but I am an important part of that loop. So kind of how it comes about is I am telling the weapon where to go. So in a communications or marketing strategy, you're kind of defining where you want the message to hit. The computer, the algorithm, the technology is actually getting that message there. It's actually getting the weapon where it needs to be. So I'm directing where everything's going, while on this point, it's doing all the rest of the work for me. And that makes it very easy to put multiple, for us, weapons in the air, or multiple campaigns out there simultaneously, and I can kind of direct them very fast as being done by the technology. Uh, which makes me much more effective in the end because I don't have as much work to do. Now, this isn't just a once and done thing. As things move and things adjust, we can change real time exactly where there's going. We can adjust aim points and we can put the man right back in the loop to allow the technology to update what we're doing, which is, uh, which is hugely important for us because things, uh, things in my line of work are very dynamic. They have to change very quick. So if you look at that technology and, that, and how we're precise with it, we can then move to data visualization and how we use that. So we're all probably very familiar with data visualization, seeing stuff. So if I showed you this map of LA, you're like, based on these incomes, I would know where I want to see and what I want to do. It's kind of a, for us, this would be considered a one input model, which is very basic in my line of work. For us in an aircraft, we probably have 15 to 20 sensors operating simultaneously, bringing us information in from all different areas. And if you try to make sense of all these different inputs simultaneously, it's not going to happen. You, you can't physically do it. Um, and we needed a way of visualizing all this data that's coming in, all the data the aircraft's telling us, all this information very quickly without really caring in some respects where it came from. And this is where data visualization came for us, is where the basics in the old days was just, we're just going to show you very neat blobs. It's going to work great. It's, you're going to have a page 
essentially in a computer for each of these in the aircraft, and you're responsible for correlating this. It didn't really work very well in the end. And what they came up with was with a, uh, essentially a smoothing of all these sensors for one picture for you. And what this did was allow you to see the big picture. And if you want to get into the weeds, the aircraft will let you get in the weeds. The data visualization will let you get in the weeds. But that's not what we cared about. We cared about the big picture of what the aircraft was telling us and how then we could use that big picture to now make decisions with what we have on board and where we're going. And this, uh, this took a lot of technology and a lot of computational power in the aircraft. The number of computers in a plane now are astronomical. Um, I think the newest aircraft coming out, the F-35, has over a billion lines of code in it. To give you an idea of how much processing power these aircraft are using. And most of it is just for this. It is synthesizing data from everywhere to display in an efficient manner and use in an efficient way. So this is just one example of one aircraft and all the data it's doing. So let's take this example of one aircraft and kind of move over to information distribution. I see one thing. Well, I'm out there with 40 other aircraft, and they're all seeing just as much information as I am, and it may be the same, or it may be different, or it may not even correlate at all, and we can start working through that. Well, in typical communications fashions, we would use a voice channel to try to relay all this information. Well, all this information that we're trying to relay on a voice channel is not working for us. In addition, there's a lot of other assets out there supporting me and supporting us to make sure we understand what's going on. So you're going to have radar aircraft, you're going to have ground stations, you're going to have all this up. And they're all going to have a different picture also. Everyone is seeing something different. And when you want to make a decision or when someone wants to make a decision, they now have to explain that decision to everyone all across these nets. It's hard. Like, uh, Communicating over voice or over chat or over email, trying to make these decisions across all these functional areas is hard. Uh, and so we stopped doing it. <laughs> uh, and what we did is we started now linking everything together via the data so that everyone else is now seeing everything else that's going on. Uh, and what this came up with is what we refer to as a common operational picture. Everyone from the top to the bottom, all across the way, sees the exact same thing at the exact same time. And now people above or below can make decisions off that. So instead of your boss calling you and saying, hey, what's going on with this? And you know what's going on. He just looks at it. And if he has additional questions, he can send them. Likewise, if you need support at the tactical level, you can send that report, uh, re a support request up. And they can see what you're seeing. And they can start putting more uh, assets or more money or more funding to you based on what's happening here. And this really starts uh, leveling the playing field on what's occurring uh, in a number of different ways. So, um, what this allows is decisions to be made dynamically on what's occurring exactly at that moment. Everyone's seeing the same thing. So if over here we're doing really well, I don't need those assets over there anymore. I can pull what's making that really well, keep the minimum number, and push those assets, push that funding, push whatever else to the places that are harder. And that dynamic allocation of resources comes from everyone knowing exactly what's going on simultaneously. And that's really where we've made great strides in the last 15 years is this dynamic allocation of resources and the information distribution and how that picture is being developed. Um, now, as necessary, you can dig into it more and you can make it more of a big picture. So for example, in the cockpit at the tactical level, I don't need the entire big picture. I care more about what my portion in that common operating picture is. And I can dig down into that more. However, at the very top level, they can get that very broad brush overview without really worrying about the tactical implications or the small level implications that are going on. Behind all this, though, is a algorithm that's trying to bring all this disparate data in, which has various confidence levels going on. So each different portion of the data has a different confidence level, and they have to weight these confidence levels against what everyone else is seeing and start racking and stacking to give this picture. It's not as easy as just taking various data points and putting them on top of one another. Uh, and this is where some of the design of the system becomes very important, where you have to have the right confidence level for the right sensor, for the right thing, so that people are getting the right information. It's still garbage in, garbage out. So if you say something's really important and it's not, everyone's going to see the wrong information. Uh, and that's still hugely important that the right information is getting passed. Is everyone deciding on their own confidence levels? The computers, are just, the computers are doing all the confidence level work. Um, and this also brings in a different aspect. Uh, technology doesn't see everything. Uh, we, we see this on a daily basis. Technology doesn't see everything. We still have eyeballs. We can still look outside. We can still make judgments based on what we see the hard part then is communicating what we're seeing that's not in the picture so that people understand the judgments. Uh, and we standardize this to a very high degree when we start going off script 
so people know why we go off script. We have it kind of, this is what I'm seeing, this is how I'm seeing it, this is what I'm going to do about it, and that information is then passed up. So the information like, okay, we're not seeing something here. It's not making sense to us, but it's making sense to them out there in the field. Let them use their training, use what they know, and go do that, and we'll bring them back into the fold after that's done. Um, and this is, uh, it'll bring me to another point I'll discuss, but technology like this isn't hard to beat, at least from my end, where we have good guys and bad guys, right? When you start relying on the technology too much, there are ways around the technology. Um, and an over-reliance on technology with an under-reliance on the people that you've trained to do it can have the exact same disastrous results. So you have to understand the people, you've trained them, you understand them, they're going to make the right decisions based on what they're seeing. The answer to that is yes and no. So uh, we, are in, uh, we anticipate what the technology is telling us, or is not telling us. So we know there are blind zones in our technology, right? There are blind zones in any technology. We actually brief and do contingencies to what those blind zones are. So if we know that the technology is going to do all this stuff, but it's not going to do this, we are going to over allocate resources to where we're blind if that's something we're worried about. Um, so uh, as an example, we'll just go very broad brush, stealth, right? Stealth is supposed to be invisible to radar. So because we know there may be something invisible trader out there, we would go ahead and make changes to that because we know our technology is blind to whatever other technology is out there. We would adjust that within our plan. But it all goes into what your pre-mission plannings are. Is my pre-mission planning factor say, well, do I have to worry about this or not? If not, we don't have to worry about this blind zone in our technology and we'll move on. Um, so there's an anticipation there. But there's also, uh, we'll talk about this in execution, a very dynamic execution, where if you see something that's unexpected, then you're going to dynamically make a change based on something that you did not plan for. Uh, and that occurs almost all the time. Uh, no plan has ever gone the way we've planned it once <laughs> in my 15 years of doing this. Something always changes. And so we plan for planning not to work, I guess, is a good way to talk about that. Does that answer the question at all? Yep. And so the first information distribution was how do we spread this information out? The second part of information distribution is precision. Uh, imprecisely applied precision is worse than not doing it at all. <laughs> at least we found that in our line of work. In that if I was looking to you know, apply some effects to this building, if I want to hit the foyer out here and the mechanical place in the back, that's great. If I don't know where they are and that's my targets, it's not worth me trying to apply precision to this because I don't know what I'm actually trying to do. And it's actually worse if I hit the exact wrong targets because I didn't apply enough uh, force, enough assets, enough allocation of what I had to this, that it becomes worse and I have to go back and do it again. Uh, and this knowing of where I need to attack comes into the intelligence side of the information distribution. You have to know what you're actually doing and where everything's located. This is why the U.S. has 15 some odd intelligence agencies is because when we go to do something, we need to know what we're looking for. We need to have all that background information. It's not, for us, it's not just location. This is a location. I need to know what structure the roof is made out of, what the air void depth is, what type of material my target's made out of. If there's a fiber optic line, if I'm looking to cut at where its location exactly within the building is. So you're looking at a very fine tooth uh, precision capability. And if we don't have the information, we can't apply it. And that's one of those things we have to know in our background is, do we have the appropriate information to actually do what we're, we can do? Uh, in a marketing standpoint, I would imagine this applies to, you know, where am I going to get the best effects in a certain zip code via certain stores, certain advertisements, all this information. You know, if I'm driving down the road and I have a billboard out there, who's driving on that road at what times of day, what demographic do they come from? And if I don't have all this information, it doesn't make sense for me to try to understand the precision with the, which I'm applying my communications message because it's, it's just going to be lost in the clutter at that point. Um, and so the background information is almost as important, and the technology used to do that is actually doing the campaign itself. At least that's uh, our, uh, our point of view on it. Um, so that's kind of the information distribution stuff. Uh, I will say the most important part, though, is the training aspect. Technology is great. All the neat stuff it can do is wonderful, but if the person can't use it, understand it and apply what they're doing, you just wasted a lot of time and money and resources in developing the technology, uh, which is why our training program is very long, uh, which is also why I'm tied to a 10-year contract when I first joined the Navy, because of how much money and how much training they put into just me understanding what's going on. 
And so the first part of training we'll talk about is just understanding the data visualization. It is not intuitive at first, I will say. You are getting fed so much information, it becomes a fire hose, that you just can't understand everything coming at you. And so what we do is we start small and go big. We find the uh, data sources that are gonna get you the most bang for the buck, and we start guys on the data visualization that way. And then slowly, over years, you start adding in more and more uh, inputs, more and more sensors, more and more off-board sources to this, so that it's almost by year three to four that they fully incorporate a full picture of what the aircraft is capable of. And it's this training to understand the technology which is the first step. And it is not a short step and uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of mistakes in understanding what is being presented to you to get it right. Um, which, is, uh, which will take us into the next step of training to use this, the technology. Understanding it's one thing but actually having the ability to use it in an effective and efficient way is something completely different. Um, as a guy goes becomes a pilot, he is not a danger to anyone himself for the first five years. Uh, that's how long it takes to understand the mission, understand the technology, understand everything going on before you can effectively use it at all. So that five year process is all just to get him up to a step that now he can effectively do the mission. And then after year five, we don't let them have the responsibility for making decisions for anyone else for another two years. And then it's not until year 10 to 12 where you're put in charge of larger packages of 40 aircraft. Because it's not until that time that you have the experience with what the actual job is and how to allocate resources efficiently in this uh, mechanism that you're going to be useful in doing it. So it is a very long process for us to not only learn the mission, learn the technology, learn all this stuff, but use it efficiently and effectively. Because if we were to do it the other way, all that money would be wasted and we wouldn't have really what, uh, what we consider a successful, uh, a successful job. And so the training aspect is often overlooked, but uh, we, uh, we are constantly, I would say 98% of what we do is training and 2% is execution. What's the average age? Um, I would say 27, 28. So that's the only job millennials will stay at for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Ties to it. They do. <laughs> they, uh, they tie uh, us to I it. I couldn't keep someone that long. And yeah. Um, <laughs> but for us, the training aspect, over three years, you're probably getting $5 million worth of training in three years. Um, so the, the payback for that is pretty, pretty lengthy. The pilots also want to trying to take what we're doing and work with different universities to actually have a structured curriculum so that people graduating already are at that you know, three that to be a four year of training. And, uh, with, I mean, they also, we get not significant in the business world, but within the government, there are significant bonuses for pilots and other people with very highly technical skills to stay in. They, they will offer you, at, the, at that 10 year point where you can either go or, or stay, there, there are significant bonuses to keep people in. Yeah, yeah. Yes. What's that? How many people do you stay? How many people opt in? 30% maybe? Maybe. Um, it's not a large number because go uh, the airlines are hiring right now, yeah. which is uh, which is nice, and you'll probably make more money doing that. Yeah. Um, the other aspect that we have a problem with is we spend a lot of time away from home, so that is a very big drain on people wanting to stay. I mean, I can I've probably spent three years over in the Middle East, and it's hard for me to tell my wife to say, "Hey, I'm going to go back again," yeah. and she's like, "Ah, you know, we have two kids. I really don't think that's a good idea right now." Um, so that's the other part that's kind of, yeah, <laughs> that's not how she says it, you're right. <laughs> it's a little more forceful than that. Uh, so, so question, so in the 10-year yes. curriculum, I'm imagining that the technology is advancing constantly. It is. So how do you, how do you keep up with that um, if there's like a two, five, ten year structure and you know, <coughs> after five years your technology has changed and it sort of doesn't apply anymore, then do you spend right. another five years or how do you no, so the two parts of the training are training for the technology and training to understand the mission. The mission itself doesn't change a whole lot. It does, you know, here and there. But when new technology becomes available, we actually have a group. Their whole job is to ring it out, figure out how it works, the best way to integrate it, and then they go, here's how to use it. Here's your training curriculum. Here's everything for this new piece of technology. Go forth and do this and execute the curriculum. So that when people receive it, it's not just, hey, here's something, go use it and figure it out. No, here's how to use it, here's the best way to use it, here's the most efficient way, we've tested it, we beat it up, and this is how we think we should do it. Uh, and so that process, depending on how 
big the technology is can be very quick or very small. So if I'm getting just something new, like the software is being upgraded. Well, a new software upgrade with nothing significant other than some bug fixes and a couple new capabilities, that's probably a one week training. You know, We'll get this, we'll throw you in the simulator, you'll push the buttons, figure it out very easy. Hey, we're completely changing the way data is distributed. That's gonna be a very significant uh, training evolution to, to go through that. Um, and so it, it just depends, but there's a group whose whole job is to figure that out before it even gets to the guys that are on the front line doing stuff. So, yes. Quick, quick follow up. So, as, as training, let's say that there is a major rollout of mm -hmm. some, a new technology. I'm just thinking about it in terms of uh, marketing and change management perspective. We have people at different steps. How do you guys manage, um, manage that process? So, if it's something very large, we actually take a cross section. We take everyone from very senior to middle to junior. Because if you only train one of them, as things go on, you're not gonna have the junior people to come fill up. So for example, a new airplane is coming online or something like that, complete technology shift. We are gonna take a cross section of everyone that's there and we are gonna start at that point. So there are people in different levels. So five years from now, we have people with the experience that can keep operating the technology. Um, so it's not just the senior people together, not just the junior people. We don't take everyone all at once, but we'll take a small subset of people all different experience levels and start them all at the same time, just to make sure the, the continuity and the understanding of the technology is there. Make sense? Cool. Um, so that's kind of the training aspect. Training is uh, what we do day in and day out. The uh, other thing we do day in and day out is planning. Uh, we like to plan a whole lot. Uh, we are never stopped planning. It's always going on and it's never any easier than it was the first time. So. This is kind of how we do it. Uh, this is probably your standard double loop learning. You've probably seen at some point in a, a course somewhere. Uh, we take parts of this very seriously and we take parts of this not very seriously. Uh, and that's, uh, you may seem backwards, the parts we take seriously and the parts we don't take seriously. So the first part when you want to do something is figuring out what is it you actually want to do and be very precise about what you want to do. Where do you exactly want to see your effects hit? And then take all that intelligence you have and see where they marry up together so you can figure out, well, can I actually do that or not? Do I have the information to hit this sub-demographic and this sub-geographic area on this one area? If you can't do it, then you need to kind of back out what your scope is a little bit. Uh, and then from there, we go into the planning and analysis phase. Um, so we treat planning a little bit differently. We kind of think of it as the uh, suitcase you take on vacation. If you take a really big suitcase on vacation, you're gonna fill it all up with the stuff you may or may not need. If you take a small suitcase, you're probably only gonna take exactly what you need. We do this to planning. We constrain our planning over and over again, where instead of getting as much time as you need to plan, no, we're only gonna give you three hours. In that three hours, you may get an 80% solution. That's probably good enough for what we need for today. Um, if I give you eight hours, I can get a 90% solution. If I give you three weeks, I am probably only gonna give you a 95% solution. So is that additional two weeks and six days worth the additional 5% of consistency I'm gonna get with that plan? And our answer is no. Um, we purposely do this in training, we purposely do this operationally, where we constrain that. And by constraining the plan, what we learn is we get a baseline of what we wanna do, it'll be pretty close, but then we take a subset of that and say, well, let's look at contingencies. Let's look at all the stuff we're not really planning for and come up with ways where we can kind of adapt real time to the stuff we're not expecting because you're not gonna build a perfect plan, so we'd rather spend some of our time adapting to the plan vice just holding firm to the plan. Um, and there's a whole, so I could talk about hours on how we do that uh, contingency planning, but to suffice it to say is you need to look at your intelligence, look where the weakness is there, and start seeing what's most likely, what's most threatening, and what just we can accomplish, and start making contingencies based off that within the intelligence and planning process. Now, the other part of planning is you have to know what you can do. If you want to do something, you don't have the capability to do it, is start finding someone else that does have that capability and bring them into the planning process. Because what we found is we don't have the ability to do everything. There are times we're gonna to need to talk, uh, I'm Navy, so I've talked to the Air Force, which I actually hate doing, but sometimes we need to bring them in and talk to them about something we can't do internally, <laughs> and vice versa with them. But you also need to look at how your unit or your organization operates. Is the way we operate even conducive to what we're trying to accomplish? Everyone has you know, restrictions within their own organizations that allow them to do stuff and not do stuff. And so if you can't accomplish it because of an organizational restriction, that's something you need to go back within your organization or find another organization that can actually do it for you. 
and so if we constrain the planning, we, uh, we don't necessarily constrain the brief, but we practice to how we are going to convey this information prior to doing something over and over and over again. Because the best thing we want to do is if we get everyone on the same sheet of music and they all know what the objective is, as things change, they will be able to real time make the decision that I want them to make. Uh, and that's the hard part is conveying, this is where we want to accomplish, this is where we want to go. I trust you with all your training to make the right decision based on what I'm telling you. And so to effectively convey this in a short amount of time, uh, say an hour or two before going on a mission, is much better than trying to get everyone together for two days and tell them exactly what's going on. With that, we rely a lot on standardization to make up for the shortness in briefing. So for us, our organization has things that we are going to do standard. We have it written down, set up, where I say, we're going to take off and we're going to join up this way. It's standard. I don't have to tell everyone how I'm going to do it. It's already been written down. It's already been discussed. It's a standard process in our unit. Now, if I want to change that, then I'll brief that in more detail. But the standardization process allows us to cut the planning. It allows us to cut the briefing time to give us a very quick way of accomplishing what we need to do and pushing that information out. This brings us to execution. I'm not quite sure how a majority of marketing goes. I hope it's not, I plan, 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 hit play, and hopefully after it's all done, something good happened. Uh, we are in the dynamic execution. Nervous laugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hope it's not like that. Uh, we are in the dynamic execution. As things change, as things roll, there is an instantaneous change in how we operate and what we do. So as we start seeing the picture of the information coming in, we are then dynamically reallocating resources exactly to where that change in the picture happened. Uh, and this is hugely important for us. And it happens both with man in the loop and outside the loop. So we can program pre-planned responses into the aircraft and all the technology so that as things happen instantaneously in less than a tenth of a second, the technology is taking care of that. They are updating themselves with the picture that way. Uh, I would kind of imagine this is how it happens with online advertising. As things come in, it's instantaneously pushed out based on what you're seeing. Now, there's the bigger change that require a dynamic decision from someone who knows what's being accomplished. And that's where we come into the picture, where we can start dynamically allocating the larger resources to what's changing. Um, and this takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of practice, a lot of failure, unfortunately, to get it right. Um, but when you get it right, things go swimmingly efficient, and you come back, and you're like, well, that was nothing. Um, but it's getting to over the failures, getting over the things you missed to learn how to do that again. So the dynamic execution where things are changing instantaneously is, is really important to us because a typical mission from uh, we are all together at one point, we're going to go in and come out, typically lasts less than 20 minutes. So in that less than 20 minutes, there are things happening every second of that time that we need to adjust and update to. Which comes into the thing where we put more effort into anything else that we do, which is talking about what happened and making those changes afterwards. We will take that 20 minute flight and we may talk about it for the next 10 hours. Uh, no kidding. We will pick apart every single thing that happened. Do you just like stand in a room and do that all together? Uh, sort of. <laughs> we have, uh, you've seen those command centers in NASA and stuff like that? Those are what our debrief rooms look like. That is not where we plan. We plan on tables and chairs and desks. And our debrief rooms have the computers and the ana uh, analysis stuff and all this information for us to pick it apart. Um, I am not proud to say, but I've taken three minutes and talked about it for three hours once. Uh, but we were just picking apart every little thing that happened because we want to do is make us better. And that's how the only way we're going to make us better is by picking it apart. And the, the aspect that's really the most unusual for us is there's no rank when we do this. I can treat the senior most person, if they make the mistake, the same as I treat the junior most person. So that we're all bringing it out in a very even playing field so that um, it becomes natural for us. It becomes natural for us. Very safe environment. It is. Mm -hmm. it, Which is on my business. Yeah. <laughs> um, but our understanding is we're trying to make it better. And, you know, there's a lot of personalities in the military, and a lot of people want to get atop. Uh, and it's the people that um, don't go to this very flattening organization in this part that actually aren't promoted. Um, because they're not seen as an asset to the organization after that if they're pushing their own personal agenda. Or they don't want to look like they did something poorly. We will bring out uh, poor execution time and time again. Um, but the whole portion of bringing it out is we turn that right back around into how we operate and how we do it the next time. So that as we see this change, if it's an organizational issue, we are going to change how the organization is structured. We'll change our standardization. We'll change our training to fit an issue that's occurring over and over again. 
if it's an individual issue where a person is just not getting the additional, they're not understanding a concept, we push that back into the training. So they're getting more training to better understand what's going on. The whole purpose of this is spending all this time here is the next time we go into the plan and brief and debrief, that portion happens very fast. We've already been through it over and over again to understand this. Now, uh, this whole plan, brief, execute, debrief, lessons learned can be a very long, drawn out process for big events. So you just execute a days long campaign, well you'll have a days long thing. Uh, on the other side, I've seen and been a part of special operations missions where this whole lo loop happened in 20 minutes and we start all over again. We did the mission, 20 minutes later it was done, 20 minutes later we start a new mission. And just like that, we're doing this. You can do it very quick, you can do it very slow depending on what you need out of that particular uh, uh, mission or event that you're doing and how you need to turn it around for the next time. Uh, it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process all the time. It's important to get what you need to learn and do it again. Just curious, as you mentioned the Air Force, is yeah. their data and the way they view the analysis around the data and software the same as what you operate with? It's because I think if you're sharing a mission, if you've got one person doing something separate, right. how you can mingle the two? That is actually a huge issue we have in acquisitions, believe it or not where people pigeonhole certain technologies in certain places. For the most part, we've been getting better about uh, service collaborative acquisition. Um, I wouldn't say we're good at it. I would say the acquisition community has a long way to go, uh, but we're getting better at it. Now, for aircraft systems, we're pretty good at it. When you start getting to all the analysis tools, when we're not flying, we're not very good at it. And you have a lot of uh, silos in how that information is viewed, unfortunately. And then when you get in the intelligence world, it's even worse. Uh, uh, the ability to share information across is, is a lot harder than you might think it is. So, um, but the whole point is that we're doing this either quickly or slowly depending on what we need, but it's always, always, always done. So as you see these lessons learned, I just go back to operating procedures and planning, but that information is also going to feed intelligence, believe it or not. So if you saw something that was not what was expected or not saw, or like we hit, like in the marketing, we hit this demographic we weren't planning on hitting at all, that gets fed back into the analysis portion of everything that's going on. So that lesson's learned actually. It loops back the other way. Um, the other thing it will uh, do is what you figure out there, you need to know if you need to go do that mission or, or thing again. Like whatever you were doing, do you need to do it again? Did you succeed or fail? And if you failed, how are you going to change what you're actually looking to do within that mission one more time because you have all these lessons. Let's figure out how we'll do it right the second time. Uh, because we are not a 100% success organization, nor do I think anyone here is probably that way either. So um, we're always trying to go back and refeed the same thing over and over again to get it right uh, for us. So uh, coming off that, uh, to kind of wrap up, I'll kind of go back to the original discussion I started with the 1943 shipyards and how we would kind of look at this today. So. Uh, this is Hamburg, Germany. I am not saying we are going to go bomb Hamburg, Germany, so please don't put those words in my mouth. This is the same shipyard as it is today. And we're just going to take a very general mission of we want to stop the long-term uh, repairability of ships coming in here. That's what we want to accomplish. So let's break it down on how we're going to do that. Well, we have floating dry docks up to the north, and we have a non-floating dry dock or a fixed dry dock up there. We take those out, we can kind of stop repairs. Well, we also have cranes that are used to move heavy equipment. So the cranes are going to help feed into that. Additionally, if we shut down the power on their power station on board, that's going to stop them from kind of getting all the power there. And then they have lines of communication for heavy equipment to come in there. So we've taken a very big mission and kind of subset it down into these is how we're going to accomplish the mission. From there, we're going to pick out the specific points in each of those places that are actually going to accomplish that. So it's not, I need to take this whole thing out. For a dry dock, I need to hit the hinges on the door of the dry dock so the door falls off and it's not usable anymore. That's how specific that we get when we are looking at stuff, is the very small thing that will make a very big effect. So as we have all these different points that we want to hit based on the intelligence that we received, we are going to feed all this information into a computer. And the computer is going to come back and tell us, well, based on all this information, this is the weapon target pairing for us, or how you might think of, these are the communication strategies I need to hit that particular place. And the computer is coming back with this information. We can go look at it, adjust it, refine it, based on our experience, and the computers aren't always right. So as we're doing this, we're kind of planning out how we're doing from a very large to a very small. So then as we brief this and plan this, well, as we go to the execution phase, 
those are floating dry docks. They can move them anywhere, right? So what I thought was initially going to be there may not be the actual case when I actually go to do this type of mission. So as those move in places, as I come in there, I'm using what I see through all the different systems I'm getting to say that moved, I need to adjust this to here, and now I'm going to let the technology do that as I make adjustments real time to what has changed from what was in the planning process and the intelligence process. So I can come back, we'll do this, and then after that, we'll turn it around and say, well, this moved. Hey, you guys in intelligence, so you know this moved, this is why it moved, this is where it moved to, so they can refeed that whole system on what they see there. And this is kind of the very big to small to dynamic that we see on a daily basis that uh, I would hope, or at least I hope, is useful to you guys to see a process kind of in something different, but how it can be applied uh, across there just as a general operating scheme. So. Um, that's really uh, all I have for 70 years of change. Uh, <laughs> hope it was useful for you guys. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to answer them. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No